Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm going to be talking, uh, as said, about uh, fiber bundle codes. And more generally, I'm going to be talking about um, products of codes, which is just a, a very useful general tool. And I'll try and explain all that. And this is uh, joint work with uh, Jung Wen Ha and uh, Ryan O'Donnell. So um, we are, as everybody noticed, meeting virtually. So I would like to um, encourage people, please, though, still to ask questions in chat. And uh, Chair, please feel free to interrupt me if there's any questions you think um, that I really should get to, please do that. Um, 2020 has been very eventful. And um, one way in which it has been eventful uh, is for quantum LDPC codes. Um, so I'm going to get into some more details of exactly uh, what this slide means, but I just wanna start by highlighting um, some of the progress that occurred by a large number of different people. Um, so uh, this, this talk is about quantum LDPC codes. I'll explain that in more detail and how to improve their distance. Uh, but just to give sort of a quick set of records and uh, later we'll get into more details about what this means. Um, the Torah code due to Kataev uh, in 1997 on n qubits has a distance that only scaled as the square root of the number of qubits. And um, this is uh, hard to exceed the square root of the number of qubits. And you might've thought this was sort of some kind of fundamental barrier, but uh, Friedman, Meyer and Luo uh, managed to improve this to um, the fourth by improved by a fourth power of, the, of a, a one quarter power of a logarithm, so just barely above square root, uh, a tiny difference, but enough to show that square root was not a fundamental um, barrier. This got then a lot of things happened in 2020. This went um, by another factor of log n by uh, Everett Kaufman and Zaymor, and they showed also decodability beyond the square root barrier. Then log n to any power by Kaufman and Tesler. Uh, then finally, there was uh, the first code that was uh, really strictly bigger than n to the one half, not just by polylogs, but um, something, uh, you know, at least n to the 0.51. Um, so that's the code I'll be talking about. And this code is uh, one-sided decodable, meaning it's decodable against one kind of errors and conjecture that it's two-sided decodable. Um, then, in fact, uh, it got the distance record reached n over log n, so almost linear distance by Pentelev and Kalachev. And... Um, then a, a, a final result, uh, Broekman and Eberhardt um, got a code of distance n to the three-fifths, which could be understood as a de-randomization of this um, fiber bundle code and uh, some improved parameters using a trick of uh, Pentelev and Kalachev. So um, all these three, these last three codes uh, all involve some ideas of twisted products. And in fact, to some extent, every single one of these codes on here uses the idea of products. So I'm going to try to uh, talk a lot about that before getting into our specific code. So I want to explain what a quantum LDPC code is, compare progress between quantum LDPC codes and classical codes, talk about products and more generally twisted products, and then finally get into some of the specific instructions. So um, what is a, a, a quantum code? Throughout this talk, when I say a quantum code, what I mean is a CSS stabilizer code. Uh, CSS meaning all the stabilizers are products of Xs, or products of Zs, you know, x1, x2, x3, z1, z4, z7, something like that, but there are no mixed xz stabilizers. Um, this, uh, I'll get to why this is a meaningful restriction. So we'll use the notation um, nkd to indicate a, a code which has n qubits. These are the number of physical qubits, stores k logical qubits, and has a distance d. Uh, obviously, for a given n, you would like both k and d to be as large as possible. Um, why is it reasonable to restrict to CSS stabilizer codes? Well, if you have a non-CSS stabilizer code, um, then um, it was shown, uh, Ravi Limas and Turhal, that given any non-CSS stabilizer code with some NK and D, you could construct a CSS stabilizer code, which had some constant factor changes in NK and D. So if you're looking at things like scaling, like does the distance scale as the square root or some other power, um, this is preserved under this map. And this map they have preserves the LDPC property. So for purposes of talking about LDPC uh, stabilizer codes, we might as well just talk about CSS stabilizer codes. Um, so what is this, this term LDPC I keep using? LDPC is short for um, low density parity check. And that means that every single stabilizer in the code um, has weight O of one. Every stabilizer acts on only water one qubits, perhaps four, perhaps five, but does not scale with n. Um, also, every qubit has only order one stabilizers acting on it. Um, this, is, this is very important, this LDPC property. This, this means that um, you can have a short quantum circuit, a low depth quantum circuit, um, 
in an order one depth working in parallel to measure all the stabilizers in order one round. So there's these sort of, um, people are probably familiar with say the Torah code, there's this nice sort of Northeast Southwest pattern to very quickly measure the stabilizers efficiently. Um, that's a very efficient pattern, but uh, in general, um, there's uh, for any CSS, uh, for any stabilizer code, you have this ability to measure um, all the stabilizers in order one rounds. There's another kind of code called the subsystem code. Um, if you're not familiar with it, then it's you know not important for this talk, but uh, one question we often get asked, well, there are subsystem codes that were known for a long time with close to linear distance. Um, subsystem codes have, uh, they are stabilizer codes that have some number of logical qubits that you ignore called the gauge qubits. And um, these subsystem codes had uh, the property that if you took products of stabilizers and gauge generators, you can make them low weight. And so it seemed like, yes, they're LDPC because there were low weight generators you can measure, but these low weight generators involved the gauge qubits. And in order to actually measure the stabilizers, you had to measure many of these generators. And this makes them not suitable for font tolerant applications. So um, this motivates the, the interest in um, LDPC stabilizer codes. These are really the codes most suitable for fault tolerant application. Um, classically, classical LDPC codes are uh, very well studied and used all the time. Uh, you know, if you talk on a cell phone, uh, LDPC codes are used in order to um, correct against errors that are caused when the uh, information you send is transmitted over radio link. Uh, they're just, they're used all over the place. So a classical LDPC code is instead of having qubits, you have bits and you could just say that, you know, you have stabilizers that are just, you know, products of Zs like Z1, Z3, Z5 or something like that. You don't have many X stabilizers, you just have Z stabilizers. And um, this will protect against bit flip errors. You don't care about phase errors. It's a classical communication channel. Here, um, people are interested in LDPC for a different reason. The reason they're interested in LDPC is not because they're interested in short depth quantum circuits to decode these codes. People are interested in uh, LDPC codes classically because um, many efficient decoding algorithms use the assumption that the code is LDPC. So there's a, another reason to be interested in this because often LDPC codes are suitable for efficient decoding. Although, um, you know, it's a separate question. Uh, for all these LDPC quantum codes, which ones are, have efficient decoding algorithms and which ones don't. Um, classically, there's, so, the, so people will often use the term good LDPC code. So a good LDPC code is one where these parameters N, K, and D, uh, where K and D are both theta of N using the computer science notation, meaning they're both of order N. So the, the number of logical qubits is proportional to N and the distance of the code is proportional to N. So you might have a code on, you know, a thousand, sends a thousand physical bits and yet perhaps it actually encodes 500 bits of information, something proportional to the number of uh, actual bits you transmit. And the distance of the code is also proportional to it too. So this is rather remarkable that these exist. Um, but although it's remarkable that these exist, it's actually fairly easy to write them down. Essentially, you just write down a random parity check matrix. You write down a random classical LDPC code, and you've probably done it. Um, you've probably succeeded in writing them down. That certainly doesn't mean that the field of classical LDPC coding theory is over. Um, you know, it's possible to write down good codes, but people get interested in, you know, um, optimizing the, uh, making the distance and the rate as large as possible, making the decoding as efficient as possible. And this is, you know, a very practical question because if slight improvements in codes can mean that you um, can be mean a lot of money because it can mean that you can transmit information as effectively without building uh, as much actual hardware. Um, so there's a large field of classical LDPC codes. However, um, thus far, there are no good quantum LDPC codes. In fact, there is not even yet linear distance, although it's gotten very close. Um, one of the reasons is um, it's not even easy to write down a quantum LDPC code. So for a classical LDPC code, I said it suffice just to write down any sparse parity check matrix and that probably does it. That's probably a good um, classical LDPC code. If you write down a quantum LDPC code, you have a constraint. The X stabilizers and the Z stabilizers need to commute with each other in order to be measured simultaneously. And if you try to mimic this classical construction, you just say, I'm going to write down a random X stabilizers that are low weight, then probably there are no low weight Z stabilizers that will commute with them. There's not even, even regardless of the question of what the distance is, there's simply no way to even write down uh, a, lo a low weight um, code. And that's precisely because if once you write down random low weight X stabilizers, there are no, typically no low weight Z operators that commute with them. That's the whole point of writing it down. So it's um, hard to write them down. And uh, at the same time, per partly for the same reason, it's 
hard to achieve high distance. So, you know, until the middle of 2020, the record was um, this barely above square root n and uh, then uh, then became log n to the c, c for any power, then strictly above n and uh, strictly above square root n and now, you know, almost all the way linear. Um, so there's been a lot of progress on this question. Um, so uh, one of the keys actually to every single one of those um, codes I, I mentioned, starting with the Torah code, uh, is uh, the idea of products, products of codes. So let's let's recall the idea of the Torah code. Um, you can have different geometries, uh, but you know, let's imagine that we have a square lattice. That's going to be most appropriate for talking about uh, products. And every edge of the square lattice, you have some qubit on that edge. Every vertex, you have some stabilizer that will be, um, say, a product of x on the four vertices incident to that uh, four edges incident to that vertex. Every plaquette, you have a z stabilizer, and it will be a product of z around the four edges on that. And you can check that they commute. And uh, depending upon, you know, you can imagine different topologies. Uh, but let's imagine a torque torus topology. So in this picture, I take the left edge and right edge and join them, and the top edge and bottom edge and join them. So this topology of a torus, a torus can be thought of as a product of two circles. So if you want to describe where you are on a torus, a very natural thing is to use two angular coordinates, you know, one coordinate this way and another coordinate that way. Um, it is, it is a product of two circles, you know, the product topology and so on. Um, um, but similarly, this toric code can actually be viewed as a product of two classical codes. And um, this, is, this is the idea that I want to that, that talk about, that, that products are, are, are key way to build codes. This, this idea of products is very useful. Um, and I'm going to talk about increasing generalizations of products. Um, it's very useful because it's a way to construct to get commutativity. Um, so if you uh, start with say some classical codes, which you might construct in some completely unstructured way, perhaps using some randomized techniques, then the product is a way of introducing enough structure into your construction to ensure that your stabilizers commute. So you sort of have this tension between two things, this randomness that you can introduce at one level and then this structure that you need the stabilizers to commute and the products are what can give you that necessary structure. So in order to talk about products, um, what I want to do is I want to introduce the idea of uh, chain complexes. Uh, this is partly just another terminology for talking about quantum codes. Um, there's, there's sort of a dictionary between the um, terminology of stabilizers and qubits and so on, and then the terminology of chain complexes. So to some extent, you might wonder, well, should I learn this new language? Um, if you're interested in working in coding theory uh, and you are not using this language of chain complexes. This is really just an incredibly efficient language to use. And you know, the most valuable thing is not anything I'm saying in the talk, except just get the motivation that this is really the, the best language to use. And there's a lot of very useful mathematical things that you can steal from topologists when you use this language. So um, I'm gonna give an introduction to this uh, technique of chain complexes. But if at the start, it seems like just you know, a dictionary to rewrite existing stuff, it's actually, it's actually very, very useful. Um, so what is a chain complex? A chain complex is defined by a sequence of vector spaces. Um, so I've, I've written some down here. Uh, um, yeah, I, I'm using a letter A for a chain complex A, and I'm using some subscript to indicate um, something that we'll think of as a dimension. This, this index J will be like an integer. So this might be like A2, A1, A0, a sequence of them. And then a sequence of linear maps called boundary operators. And they're written as this little partial sub J. And, um, the linear map partial sub j is a map from a sub j to a sub j minus one. So the map partial one is a map from a sub one to a zero. The map partial two is a map from a sub two to a sub one and so on. And it's often written in this notation with a sequence of letters like a two, a one, a zero and a sequence of arrows between them. So that's what a chain complex is. It's a sequence of vector spaces and linear maps with the requirement that subject to one requirement that the square of the boundary operator is zero. That if you, so if you take uh, the boundary operator squared that zero and recall this boundary operator maps you from one space to the next. So that means like partial of partial two equals zero because that mapped you from space two to space one to zero. So this is a, that's, that's what a chain complex is. Um, it's, and uh, chain complex is over F2. So when I said vector space, the vector space could be uh, over different fields. Um, and so for us, it will be a vector space over F2, meaning for simplicity, you think of the vectors as just being bit strings. They're, they're bit strings zero and one, and you know, you know some 
preferred basis and just have like some, some bit strings. A chain complex over F2 is the same thing as a quantum code. And you have three successive spaces. We could call them A2, A1, A0, whatever you want to call them. And those three successive spaces will correspond to Z stabilizers, qubits, and X stabilizers. And um, this boundary operator is a linear map, linear map between two different vector spaces. So it's a, a matrix and it's a matrix over F2. So it has zeros and ones. And the entries of this matrix will tell you, well, the map from Z stabilizers to qubits, there'll be a one if that particular Z stabilizer acts on that qubit. And similarly, the map from qubits to X stabilizers, there'll be a one if that particular qubit is in that X stabilizer. So that's the, um, that's the relation. Uh, 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 the boundary map is just exactly read off from what is the uh, what are the stabilizers of the code, um, and the, the the basis elements of these vector spaces are all correspond to choices of stabilizers, choices of qubits, and choices of x stabilizers, c stabilizers, qubits, x stabilizers, and this requirement that the boundary squares to zero is exactly equivalent to the requirement that the um, stabilizers commute. If you have a certain z stabilizer, it's the boundary of the corresponding thing is a set of qubits, and that's the qubits that the stabilizer acts on. And then the boundary of that is um, some set of X stabilizers, but it, it will be um, the set of X stabilizers that uh, are on an odd number of those qubits, and those, those that will be zero if the stabilizers commute. And a useful terminology that I'll probably slip into is to call the basis vector cells. So we might say a two cell is a basis vector for A2, a one cell is a basis vector for A1, a zero vector is a basis vector for A0. And so the two cells, one cells, and zero cells might correspond to Z qubit and X. Um, the logical operators, so the, one of the important things about code is logical operators. So these are um, the things that act on the encoded data, but don't mess up any of the stabilizers. So a Z-type logical operator is some product of Pali Z operators, which commutes with all the X stabilizers. It doesn't mess up the stabilizers. Um, and we regard to Z logical operators as equivalent if they differ just by stabilizers, two of them that, because then they'll have the same action on the encoded data. A trivial Z-type logical operator is one that's just a product of the stabilizers that acts as the identity on the encoded qubits. A non-trivial one is something that's not just a product of Z stabilizers, even though it's um, uh, even though it commutes with all the X stabilizers. Mathematically, uh, this is so well studied. There's an amazing parallel that these things developed in math are just exactly what you need for coding theory. Uh, this is called um, the homology or the cohomology if you're talking about the um, X type logical operators. And um, to introduce again some terminology, chains are vectors. So like a one chain will be a vector in A1. Closed chain vector with no boundary, and the closed chains of qubits will be the qubits that commute with the X stabilizers. And the space of closed chains, we'll write it as Z sub J modulo the boundary is called the homology. And in this particular case, for the space of qubits, it will be the space of the the, the, the closed chains of qubits will be the qubits, the, 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 the operators that commute with all the X stabilizers modulo the boundary, and that will be modulo the, the Z stabilizers. So this concept of homology. Okay, um, is the two, uh, the, the actual literal boundary of that one cell is the two zero cells at the, the, the uh, one cell. So um, you can get your chain complex and then this boundary really has this geometric meaning. It's the actual boundary of something. Uh, so, and you don't need to do it on a torus. You could take any other manifold and you could cellulate in other ways with like cubes or, or simplices or whatever, and that can give you a chain complex. Um, and as we said, it's natural to define a manifold by products of other manifolds. So a torus can be thought of as a product of two circles, or you could take a product of two tori and get a four-dimensional torus, or whatever products you like. You could take a product of a, of a circle and an interval and get a cylinder. Um, you can also directly take products of chain complexes. So if you have 
two manifolds, you have a cellulation, you get a product of the manifold that gives you a product of the cellulation, but you can do this thing without introducing the manifold. You can just take two chain complexes and define their product and they never need to come from a manifold. They could just be some chain complexes that you made up. Um, so if I write down, I have two chain complexes, I'll call them A and B, their product chain complex C. So I'm gonna write down something like C equals A times B like that. And so what do I need to specify for the product? For the product, I need to specify the, um, what are the vector spaces and what are the linear maps? Because a chain complex is given by its vector spaces and its linear maps. So the vector space, uh, I've got this formula here. So like C sub J is a sum over K of A sub K and, um, oh, sorry, there is a typo there. That should be B sub J minus K, not B sub K minus J. That should be B sub J minus K not B sub K minus J, I got that backwards. So C1 would be a product of A0 and B1 and B and A1 and B0. C2 would be a product of A0, B2, A1, B1, A2, B0. So it's anything where the dimension of the A and the dimension of the B add up to the dimension of the C. So it'll be the sum of these products. And um, the boundary operator, and I'll, I'll get, show this more geometrically in a minute. The boundary operator on C will be defined by the boundary operator on A times the identity on the C plus the identity on A times the boundary operator, sorry, boundary operator on A times the identity on B plus the identity on A times the boundary on B. Uh, this formula here, boundary on A times identity on B, boundary on uh, identity on A times boundary on B. There is in general a sign, um, we, it's, the sign's easy, uh, but we don't even need to worry about it because we're working over F2 for now. So, um, and you can check that this rule as long as A and B are chain complexes, this gives you a chain complex in that the square of the boundary operator in C is still zero. So um, how does this work out in a specific case? I'm gonna go back to the Torah code. And I said the torus is a product of two circles, but similarly, this chain complex for the Torah code is a product of two two-term chain complexes. Two-term meaning it's just got two types of uh, vector spaces like A1 and A0. Uh, so it's just defined by a single linear map. And uh, I can write you know, them down. as taking a circle and cellulating it into a bunch of one cells, little lines and zero cells, little vertices. And um, both of the chain complexes, A1, A and B are the same thing. They're both cellulations of circles exactly like this. Um, and these correspond to classical codes. So if a, a qubit, or in this case, a bit, is just this edge, um, the boundary of this bit is these two stabilizers. Similarly, this stabilizer acts on these two bits. And if you think about it a bit, you realize that this is a classical code. Uh, it's a classical repetition code. The stabilizer is ZI, ZI plus one. So each, each um, uh, stabilizer acts on a pair of bits like Z1, Z2, Z2, Z3, and so on in this I as periodic. It's just labeling the, the different edges around this circle. Um, those are the two classical codes. If you take their product, you get this toric code. There's, um, if you look at the torus, it's got zero cells, one cells, two cells. The zero cells are the points. They're marked by, they're defined by a point in the torus is defined by a point in the two circles. The one cell, well, there are two kinds. There's horizontal one cells going this way and vertical one cells going that way. And those corresponds to different terms in the result for C, C1. So one of the horizontal ones and the vertical ones, one will be the A1, B0, and one will be the A0, B1. Um, and now we get to one of the first cases where you can um, borrow some ideas from topology. And uh, there's a formula called the Kunith formula, which lets us work out the homology of this product complex from the homology of the input complexes. So without actually doing any calculation, I mean, on the torque code, everyone knows the torque code on a torus encodes two qubits, but there's a formula that says, just, just like the cells of this product complex are sums of products of cells, the homology of the product complex is sums of products. And this is generally true, works for any product. And so it says the first homology of the product complex. And again, I have a, this should be H right here. It should be, sorry, H of J minus K. I uh, got the sign wrong there. So the first homology of the product complex, so that'll be the, um, uh, uh, the thing we care about for, for figuring out the logical operators will involve the first homology of one of them and the zero homology other, or the zero homology of the one and the first homology other. There's two ways it goes in. And um, these, two, these two classical repetition codes, 
they have a first homology because they encode a single logical bit and they have a zero homology and the zero homology reflects a redundancy in the stable vectors. Um, so what you get is that they each have um, one dimensional uh, first homology and one dimensional zero homology. So their product is one dimensional and you sum the two one dimensional things, you get the two dimensional homology for this product. Um, so it's, it's a very useful thing that in this case, you can directly work out logical operators from the product from logical operators of the, of the inputs. Uh, applications of this product, um, uh, homological product codes. Uh, this is with uh, Sergey Bravi. Um, these are good quantum codes. They have linear distance and linear rate, and they only have square root weight stabilizers. They're obtained by taking two random good quantum codes that are linear weight stabilizers, very far from LDPC, and taking their product and their product gets you to uh, stays good. You can prove that one product stays good. And uh, the weight uh, of the stabilizer is now only square root. So, um, and another one, and this one I'll uh, try to talk about more is uh, uh, the hypergraph product codes. You take the two complexes that are input to be good classical LDPC codes. So the toric code arises if you take up select are just classical repetition codes. If you take the two codes in the product to be good classical LDPC codes, i.e. codes with linear rate, and linear distance, or actually one of them is the dual of a good classical code, and take our product code, take the product. Uh, this is this uh, hypergraph product code of Tillich and Zamor. And um, one of the nice things is that uh, because the Kunath formula immediately tells you that the product has linear rate. So there's this, these two these terms in the homology, and it's a product of homology of one and times homology in the other. And if one of them has a linear rate, the other is linear rate, their product, the number of qubits of each input one was n, so their product might have n squared qubits, but then each one has n logical qubits, so their product has n squared logical qubits. So the rate stays linear. So even without doing a calculation, you can deduce that the, the rate of this thing stays linear. Um, so these are, these are nice. These are codes that have um, linear rate. This is the only construction of linear rate quantum codes with, uh, with distance that's um, square root unknown. Um, what about the distance? Well, I, I gave it away. The, the hypergraph product codes have square root distance. Um, Let's, let's get into this a bit more. So uh, you can write down distance in, a product, in, in this product using this Kunath formula. So um, if I take the Torah code, one of the, the logical operators might be you know, something like this, a vertical line going up and down. And this can be written as a product of a logical operator in one code that's the entire line and a logical operator in the other code that's just a single circle. So it's, you know, it's a line going up and down and it's, it's a line in one direction times a point in the other. And um, this is a quote representative, meaning it's a particular way of writing down something that has that logical Z action. But there may be other ways of writing down the logical Z action that have lower weight. Um, you might be able to multiply by some stabilizers to reduce the weight there. But this is certainly a way of writing down a, um, a representative. So when you're talking about the distance, the distance being the, the weight of the, the the lowest of these representatives, these non-trivial representatives, this gives you some upper bounds of the distance. It tells you, well, the distance is at most this because this is some non-trivial operator, but perhaps the distance is less. Um, so it's some bounds of the distance in terms of the quote distances of the input complex. I say quote distances because it'll depend upon the weight of say representatives of H1 and H0. So it might depend not just on the logical operators in the input, but also the encode, the redundancies among the stabilizers of one of the input ones or something like that. It turns out that this bound is tight for the hypergraph product codes. Um, so that uh, um, one of the codes, the, the two codes come in with linear distance n. Um, and uh, the, the result, this gives you a square root bound and this bound turns out to be, this bound turns out to be tight. In fact, in general, this Kunath bound is tight whenever you take a product of something with a classical code. You can take some any complex and take a product with a classical code. Um, so uh, um, let, me, let me try and sort of suggest what this geometrically means. Imagine we have some toric code here and uh, maybe there's some you know, logical operator that's something going from the top edge to the bottom edge. Well, you might take that two-dimensional toric code and turn it into a three-dimensional toric code by thickening it in the vertical direction. And that's exactly taking a product with a classical repetition code. And then that line, which was the um, logical operator of the two-dimensional thing becomes a vertical sheet and its weight has been increased by because of taking this product. Um, so that's a way of increasing the uh, uh, weight, increasing the distance of the code. 
Um, what this will do is it will increase one of the two distances. When I say two distances, we might talk about a code having a certain x distance and a certain z distance, a least weight x logical operator and a least weight z logical operator. So if you think about a classical code, a classical code is very good at protecting against bit flip errors, but it has no protection against phase errors. Uh, so it has one distance might be large, but the other distance might be only order one. Um, so we need to talk about two different distances when we start talking about distance balancing. Um, and so this distance balancing, um, the input is some code uh, n, k, dx, and dz. So we're going to write two different distances, x distance and z distance. And suppose one of them is bigger, dx is bigger than dz. And um, we want to increase dz so that they're a dude. What you can do is you can take a product with a classical code or a dual of the classical code in order to make the two distances at the same order. Um, so the output is uh, a code where now there's only one distance, d, that distance is the larger of the two. So let's say it's the original dx. Um, the cost you paid is that the number of logical, the number of physical qubits went up, the number of physical qubits went up proportional to the amount that you increased one of the distances. So like if you had a distance 10 against one thing and distance one against the other, and you said, oh, okay, well, I want it to be distance 10 against both. Now you need to pay a price of 10, 10 qubits, 10 factor of 10 overhead in the number of qubits. And um, as an improvement to this by Ever Kaufman Zaymor, the, uh, the, the number of logical qubits can be to increase to when you do this. In fact, the hypergraph product codes can be understood as distance balancing. What they are is starting with a classical code, which has linear distance against one kind of error and one distance against the other error. And then you distance balance it to something that has distance n against both types of errors, but now it has n squared qubits. Um, in general, if the product of the distance is bigger than n, then the thing distance is balanced to something greater than squared. Um, so all this inspiration for product of codes comes from topology. I'm not sure what the uh, hypergraph product code inspiration was, but um, for uh, um, homological product uh, inspiration was this. I don't know exactly what the inspiration was for the other developments products. Um, but topologists know how to construct a lot of things more general than just products. So, so why should we stop there? We can borrow other ideas from them. Um, and there's a concept, uh, what's called a fiber bundle. This is something that looks like a product locally, but does not globally look like a fiber bundle. And this is a picture of a hairbrush that sometimes people show. Um, you're supposed to think of these little bristles of the brush as being fibers, which is one of the spaces in the product and the other is being um, the base. And I'm gonna give a more uh, concrete image. It's just, uh, here is a specific hey, hey, example. Matt, yeah. Matt, um, we have a question on Slack. Um, yes. So uh, Jens Eisert wonders um, the upper bound of the distances depends on the input, uh, depends on properties of H0 and H1. Uh, what are those properties? Uh, it would so be literally the least weight non trivial representatives. So uh, the least weight non trivial representative of H0 and the least weight non trivial representative of H1, because you can take the product of those two late, least weight representatives to get some representative of the product. So I put distance in quotes because distance is typically used to say refer to the least weight representative of H1. But, um, um, and uh, we should also, yeah, be a little careful about, um, yeah, that's, that's what it is. It's the least weight representative of H1. Exactly. exactly. Thank you. Okay. Um, so here is an example of a fiber bundle. This is a Mobius strip. Uh, Mobius strip. So if you took a circle times an interval, you would get a cylinder. And one way to think of a cylinder is, you know, you just take a thing and join the edges. But if you join the edges with a half twist when you join them, you get this Mobius strip. You can say it's not just a circle times an interval, it's a twisted product of a circle. And that's a, that's a twist, literal twist. Um, it looks like uh, this product of a circle and an interval locally. Anywhere you look locally, there's no distinction between this and just the cylinder. But when you go all the way around, you reverse the interval. And the terminology is that the circle is called the base and the interval in this case is called the fiber. So the fiber bundle always has a base and a fiber. And then the product is not, if it's an interesting fiber bundle is not just the product of the base and the fiber but there's some twist added on. Um, the fiber, the product is called the total space. It's usually written as E. Um, and uh, yeah, so locally it looks like a product but not globally. Um, there's a, 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 you know, there's a, precise statement in terms of topology, in terms of, you know, existence of local neighborhoods around certain points of which, uh, you know, um, but 
we're going to be interested in sort of a much more discrete uh, definition of what a, a fiber bundle is. That is, we're going to use, just as we use this idea of manifolds and solutions and manifolds to talk about things that you can do with chain complexes, I'm going to just try and give more more like dis discrete presentation of what a fiber bundle is. Um, I want to, this is this slide is kind of just for fun. Um, the Mobius strip is an example of a fiber bundle with a so-called flat connection. And there's no curvature, you know, you can uh, just imagine that really it's just like this flat strip and then sort of magically the left and right edge are joined with this twist. And that's what we're gonna care about for codes. But for fun, um, I wanna mention another example of a fiber bundle simply because it's very relevant to this whole conference. And this is the so-called hop vibration. And this is the pure states of a single qubit. So if you have a single qubit, the wave function has two complex numbers, uh, psi one and psi two. Uh, normalized to one, sum of squares equals one. Two complex numbers is the same as four real numbers. So you have four real numbers. Sum of their squares is one, and that is um, S3. It's a, it's a three sphere, not a sphere that sits in three dimensional space, that's S2, but it's like a unit sphere in four dimensional space. So it's S3. That's the, uh, the, the, the total space. Um, the base space, the base in this state you can compute the expectation value of the three different Pauli sigma matrices, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, and that gives you a unit vector. A unit vector on S2 is the base space. So the total space is this S3, the base is this S2, and the fiber is, um, uh, is, um, is uh, S1, um, which is the, the phase. But the total space, it's not just a product of where the spin is pointing and what phase it is. You, you can't come up with some consistent way of just saying, oh, uh, I'm gonna describe the space, the spin by, this is the way it points and this is the phase, uh, even though locally, that's a reasonable thing to do. So this is a, another interesting example of a fiber bundle that has some curvature. Um, but kind of just for fun, although these bundles with curvature, you know, they may be interesting to think about in the context of coding. Um, so let me try and give a very concrete presentation of uh, what a uh, what what we'll call a fiber bundle. Um, I'm going to give a case with no curvature. We've written down cases with curvature. This is going to be a twisted product of chain complexes, uh, and I'm just going to give the case where these base and fiber B and F are two-term chain complexes. They just have two different uh, like B1 and B0, F1 and F0. So the product will no longer be just the 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 there'll be the same cells in the product. So the cells will still be either a zero cell on the base and a zero cell on the fiber or zero on the base, one on the fiber, one on the base, zero on the fiber, or one in each, the same cells as in a regular product. But we're gonna change what the boundary operator is. We're gonna put a twist in the boundary operator. Um, so the boundary operator um, is, uh, is so, so, so I'm gonna write it here, uh, what the boundary operator is. And I put some subscript zero and Q to indicate this will be the boundary operator when the base is some zero cell and the fiber is some Q cell. Uh, so the boundary will be like a zero cell on the base, some cell on the fiber. And there it is just the usual base, the, the usual boundary. It's just the same zero cell on the base times the same boundary in the fiber. But things will get interesting if we have a one cell on the base and some cell on the fiber. Now there'll be two terms. One term will be what you expect. It'll be take the boundary in the fiber. The other term has this twist in it. And what is this twist? Well, it's this function phi is some twist function. It's some symmetry of the fiber. So in the case of the interval in the, in the um, Mobius strip, it's just the reflection. It's, it's either reflect or not reflect, but it's some choice of some, find some symmetry group of the fiber, this will be some element of it. And what it is is that um, you have this summation here. You have a summation over different zero cells in the boundary of the one cell. And if you didn't have that twist, it would say, well, the boundary is uh, of a one cell in the base and a some sum cell in the fiber is just that cell in the fiber times all the different zero cells in the boundary of that cell in the base. But now it's, well, some of them you apply the twist and some you don't. So in the case of this Mobius strip, the base is a cylinder, uh, sorry, a, a, a circle, the base is a circle. And um, let's draw a circle with four cells here. And if you apply no to it, and the fiber is just gonna be an interval. So again, it's just a line with a bunch of, not closed like that. If you don't have any twists, you get a cylinder, but what you might do is pick one, just one of the um, one cells in the base and say, well, when I take the boundary on the left side, I'm going to impose a twist. And on the right side, I'm not going to impose a twist. I'm going to make the phi so that there's a twist on the left, but not on the right. And that will give you the cellulation of the Mobius strip. And for any choice of this phi, this is still a, um, uh, 
a valid chain complex. And so it's a valid quantum code. Why do we do this? Why is this useful? The whole reason this is useful is that the Kunath formula also gives us upper bounds. It tells us products are great. It gives us ways of writing down quantum codes, which have these nice structure of commutativity. And that's why like hypergraph product codes can give you quantum codes with linear rate. But the problem is that there's this Kunath formula telling you that your distance can't be bigger than something because here's a representative. And this twist is to mess up the Kunath formula. Um, right, here's another example of a, um, of, a, uh, of, a, of, a, of a twist. We can imagine having the uh, torus and you can imagine, uh, and this is the kind of fiber bundle that will be relevant for all the, the three constructions that are uh, use, use them. Um, it, the, 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 the fiber is just a circle. The circle has, well, the automorphism group has the circle, rotations of the circle. It also has reflection, but we're not gonna use the reflection at all. So it has a twist. And what you could do is you could say, well, in a toric code, for example, you could say that on a certain base cell, I'm going to apply a twist. So when you go across this base cell, there is some twist. So it joins things at different twisted in some value of the in the fiber direction. There's a certain redundancy. You can move the twist around, and it's the same, the same code up to some relabel. Um, we These also twists. have another question. Yes, please. Um, yeah, is there a notion of twist that also twists the base? Ah, uh, this is a good question. Um, I'm going to. Um, yeah, let me let me let me wait till I get to like the talk about balanced product and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, there's further ways you can imagine generalizing this. So um, let me get to that later. Okay. Um, a lot of these ones are like just to answer quickly. There are, but then in a lot of cases, like yes, you um, could express it still as just a twist of the fiber, but it may be more notationally convenient to imagine twisting both. Um, so let me let me get to that later though. Um, one useful thing to note is that using twists. You can improve the distance of the torque code, sort of a hint that they're useful. Um, it's still a square root distance code, but instead of being, so it should be, the torque code on a square lattice should be distance square root n over two. You have an L by L lattice, it has distance L and it has two L squared qubits. So the distance is square root n over two. You can make it a constant factor better. Um, I'll let you work out what the constant factor is. Uh, the idea is to so take a square, attach the top to the bottom and attach the left to the right with a little twist in there. Tile torus, but the geometry has changed. Um, now you have some representative that goes from the top to the bottom like that. The Kunath formula still works enough to tell you that representative, but you no longer have a representative that goes straight across like that because when it hits the right edge, the right edge and the left edge don't meet up. We're, we're not joining the left to the right, we're joining the left to the right with a twist. So it has to make that twist up somewhere in the middle. So you might have representatives that look like that. And um, with an appropriate choice of twist, you can slightly increase your distance. So it's a hint that something can improve, although it's only a constant factor. Now, um, yeah, all these constructions, uh, the fiber bundle, the, go by various names, fiber bundle, uh, lifted product, bounce product. These are all, in this particular case, what's been studied, all the codes are fiber bundles. Um, the current best record um, is this, now there's a distance rate trade-off that you can get a distance um, up to logs uh, and, a, and a rate that trades off in a particular way given by a certain formula for uh, any value of alpha interpolating between their almost linear distance code and the um, uh, hypergraph product codes, which have square root distance and, uh, uh, and so their alpha equals one is the hypergraph product code and linear rate. Um, and actually using a twist, a, tr a trick that they found, we found that the fiber bundle codes also hit this line up to a polylog, although for not as large a range of alpha, they have an improved way of figuring out distance. Um, so all these codes, all these three ones, they all have, they're all fiber bundles in this case, although described as different products. Um, and they have a base is a classical code rather than the base being a um, circle just as in the Torah code. And uh, the, we use a random classical code in, 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 in base and we put in random twists in the fiber. So now what does this do to the distance? Intuitively, the following thing happens. You still have um, you have, let's say, n sub b and n sub f will count the number of cells in the base in the fiber. And so the number of cells in the product is going to be of order n b times n f. You still have some representative that's this vertical line that's still present. Um, and so one of the distances is at most n f. Um, and you still have something that looks a bit like that case that you had in the, in the case where it was uh, the base was a circle. I mean, now this is a highly schematic picture. Um, but things get a lot better. Uh, you know, when you look at this in the case of this being the base being a circle, if you count sort of the total weight of this line, you have some weight from this horizontal part and some weight from this vertical part. 
And this vertical weight depends upon how far it goes vertically, height, and then how much stuff goes there, sort of. And in this case, the amount of stuff that goes vertically is just in the end point of the line. It's like the end point of this line coming along, it ends and then the single point goes up vertically. So you get a, you get a added weight that's sort of of order this vertical distance. But taking the, the, the base to be a random classical code, you can make this random classical code so that things that are far from code words are, will have a weight that's also at least in, in B. So the weight of this thing going vertically will be quite large. And so the weight that you have to make up won't just be NF, it will be NB times NF. So you'll have one distance that will be NF and one will be NB times NF. Um, well, that's what it should be. We were only proved NB times square root NF using a, a certain, tr certain trick, but it's actually uh, using the improved trick, it's NB NF. Um, uh, if we try and get into this a little more detail, there's, uh, you know, this is just a sketch heuristic, you have to prove it. Um, the cohomology distance, or this is one of the two types X or Z, depending on which one you call, uh, I guess I've already said that this is X, will be, um, yeah, given by something like this vertical line. And this vertical line is really not, if we get to the Torah code analogy, it's not the horizontal vertical line, it's a lot of, it's what I've drawn here. It's something on the dual lattice going up. And there's still a Kunith-like formula that tells you that this is at least a representative. Uh, in for this kind of one, the vertical ones. Now, other representatives are given by adding boundaries and you can use the expansion properties of the base to prove that this can't reduce the weight. You could add a boundary of something that will um, improve the weight somewhere, but because the base is expanding, when you fix it in one place, you mess it up in more places. And you can use that to prove that the, uh, the, the uh, weight, um, that you can't reduce the weight uh, below this. And uh, with this, this one advantage of this proof method is then this also gives an efficient decoding algorithm up to some fr constant fraction of the distance. And this efficient decoding algorithm relies on picking a guess uh, for the thing with a small number of base cells and then greedily adding the boundary. And just as often sort of these classical LDPC code decoders use greedy algorithms that work because of expansion properties, the same thing happens here. There's a greedy adding a boundary al algorithm that provably decodes here. Um, for the homology distance, which is the other kind of distance, the one I wrote the other way, there's a similar kind of intuition uh, that, I, that, I, that I wrote before, but then this re relies on proving um, expansion properties of uh, um, not just that the base is expanding, but that something else uh, we call twist graph code, but it's the same as other expansion properties can, considered um, is also expanding. And that can be used to bound the distance in the homology case. Um, I'm gonna uh, talk now a little bit about a, a unified picture. Um, these, these, these three different constructions going by different names, fiber bundle codes, lifted product codes, balanced product code, they're all circle, bun they're all, um, circle bundles, meaning that the, the fiber is a circle. Um, and there's a question, well, could you twist the base in some way? So uh, as uh, was shown in this balanced product paper, the balanced product is sort of the most general with a very minor restriction, all balanced products are fiber bundles. And then with a further fairly minor restriction, all fiber bundles are lifted products. Um, so they're, they're pretty closely related with slightly increasing generality, <coughs> excuse me. Um, one way to understand, this is kind of a way of talking about them all in the same language. Um, one way to talk about a fiber bundle over a base is to think of taking a product of the universal cover of the base times the fiber modulo so some, some symmetries. Give an example, again, the Mobius strip, the base is a circle. The circle is, can be thought of as the real line. That's the universal cover of the circle is the real line. Modulo of symmetry translate by one. If you want to call it translate by two pi, I guess I like translate by one. So, so now you've taken the circle and you say, well, point the real line, you say point zero and one are identical. So now that turns it into a circle. Now, if you take the real line times an interval, giving you an infinite strip and mod it out by translate by one, that gives you a um, cylinder. But you can mod it out by a different symmetry. You can mod it out by the symmetry of translate by one and flip the uh, um, flip the interval. So this is taking a product and modding it out by some symmetry. Um, instead of talking about the universal cover, which is an infinite thing, we could actually talk about a finite thing um, and still take products and then mod out by symmetries. So in this case of a uh, Mobius strip, instead of thinking of the circles being this whole, being sort of very like wasteful and thinking it's the whole real line modulo translate by one, let's think it's the interval zero to two modulo translate by one. So it's an interval zero to two, but actually one to two is the same as zero to one. 
But now let's take that interval zero to two and mod it out by translate by one and flip the interval. And that gives us the, um, the, uh, uh, the Mobius strip. So um, this concept of taking a product of two things and then modding out by some symmetry of the combined thing, uh, this is what was the balance product, the most general form. And then subject to some uh, technical conditions uh, that are described in this balanced product paper, um, then in some cases, the balanced products are bundles, although it may or may not be more useful to think of them as balanced products. And in some cases, further restrictions, it's a lifted product uh, and different ones may be more general and different ones may be also easier to think about. Um, so where do we go from here? So. Um, Twisted products are seem like they're very useful for forming high distance LDPC quantum codes. And I should emphasize actually products play a role in all these things. Um, the uh, um, first construction to beat the square root N involved some construction from topology that was related to fiber bundles. Um, the uh, early 2020 constructions that were decodable beyond the square root distance barrier involved distance balancing, which is products. So products have been useful in lots of different places. We should get more optimistic now. If it's very close to linear distance has been achieved, so we must wonder, can we achieve actually linear distance with a quantum LDPC code? Can we even chain good codes with linear distance and, and linear rate? You know, it's uh, been an open problem for a long time, and now, uh, you know, one gets more optimistic that maybe one can even actually find a good quantum LDPC code. Um, can we decode these codes, these codes based on twisted products? So um, the fiber bundle code, has provable one-sided decoding uh, using this greedy algorithm. And we have a conjectured two-sided decoding, meaning one side we can provably decode efficiently against one type of error and conjecture against two, two types. Uh, so uh, it's, it's an open question, both whether we can really prove efficient decoding against both types of errors for that code and whether we can, um, for the other constructions that have been kind of whether we can prove decoding for them. Um, it may be interesting to think about bundles that have a non-flat connection whether one can come up with other interesting codes based on them, uh, or whether one can start using these twisted products where instead of just taking products of two classical things, you take products of two quantum codes and twist them. Um, there are some interesting applications back into mathematics. Uh, so I want to advertise a paper of mine with Mike Friedman. Uh, so just as um, one useful way to write down a code is to write down a manifold and put a cellulation on it, that's a way to get a torque code. We showed constructions for taking a code just defined by these X and Z stabilizers and turning it back into a manifold such that the cellulation of the manifold gives you exactly that code. Uh, it relies on a technical condition that you need to be able to lift the code to a code over um, integers, not just over Z2, um, which is true for all these constructions. And so some new results in geometry manifolds with uh, uh, novel properties have been constructed by using these results in coding theory. So you can construct a lot of weird manifolds that have very strange properties in terms of their homology, because that's just rate of a code or so-called systolic properties, which is what the geometers call it, but that's related to distance of a code by taking existing coding constructions. And um, it's interesting to wonder whether there might be further applications coming up with new manifolds in this way. Um, and one might wonder about practical applications. Um, you know, all these constructions, uh, there's only one of them that's explicit beating uh, is this uh, balanced product construction. Um, the others are ra randomized proof of existence. You know, this random construction with high probability gives you a code with the desired properties. Um, and uh, they also involve large, you know, constant factors in terms of like, well, yes, the distance does scale as this power, but you know, you might have to get to a very large number of qubits before you start to see things. So you might wonder, are these really practical? But I would like to argue that this is something we should be thinking about practically. And the reason is that the Tor code is definitely something that people think about practically. And these are generalizations of generalizations of the Tor code. So the generalization, first generalization is instead of just inputting circles into the Tor code, why not input other things, just like the hypergraph product codes. The second generalization is instead of taking a product, why not take a twisted product? So it's quite conceivable to me that, you know, look, we've got this, we've got this, this toolkit, like we can put in different inputs and we can twist the product in different ways. So maybe there's some interesting thing where it may be hard for you to prove, you know, rigorously that it has certain properties, or maybe it's just a single, rather than being a family of instances, which is what one is always interested in computer science and math, it's some specific finite size object, like, oh, here's this specific small LDPC code with these properties. But I would not be at all surprised if there's some really interesting novel small LDPC codes that might be practically useful that are based on taking this idea of twisted products and applying it on small scale and just doing some computer search to see what's out there. So I, I really would encourage that. Um, 
So let me thank you and take any more questions. Okay, yeah, thank you, Matt. That's a, a very interesting talk, great results. Um, we do have another question in Slack. Um, Maris o Ozols asked whether the qubits can be physically embedded in uh, 2D or 3D, but <laughs> uh, any dimensional space so that you could practically measure the stabilizers. Um, yeah, well, the trouble is that in all these constructions, like the base is obtained from um, some classical LDPC code. So you would need to even be able to embed a classical LDPC base and that's not going to embed well without without distortion um, uh, if uh, you know I mean yeah that's that's gonna be that's gonna be an issue and there are um, there are limits on how well uh, how, how big the distance of uh, of LDPC codes can can be in finite dimensions right um, yes yes there's also some there's also some bounds um, in finite dimensions and uh, certainly also a lot of interesting work in trying to prove you know how big a distance you can make in a, in a specific finite dimension so um, I think a lot of you know application of this might if we get into applications because that's what one is asking would either be um, applications in some you know say you have as I was suggesting people should look for some small code that's uh, interesting and and not too big and is, is, is based on some products um, kinds of applications, one might be in certain kinds of uh, physical devices where you're not so constrained with layout, um, you know, different different kinds of qubits, perhaps some, you know, some modes and some microwave guide or something like that. And another application might be if at some future point we imagine building uh, quantum devices that involve some, you know, some, some block that, that does really good fault tolerant applications within it and then has to communicate over to some quantum link to some other quantum computer that can also do very good fault tolerant computation within it and then imagine sending data between them so that within each of these uh, computing devices the locality is not so important so just as uh, you yeah. know classical LDPC codes are used nowadays like I assume that my um, cell phone is able to do all the math needed to encrypt and decrypt encode and decode over these codes uh, and don't worry too much about the locality of that um, right. Definitely requires a somewhat non-local architecture. Um, another question, uh, what would non-trivial curvature intuitively represent or provide to the code? So I think you briefly had a slide on the curvature. Yeah, um, so I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, so, so we have in our paper, we have a description of, you know, how you have to go add curvature in. And so there's some, when you move around a, this occurs like when you have some two cell in the base and you move around it, things sort of get torn in the fiber direction and you have to add in. Um, so what happens is, you know, I, I wrote, I, 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 I showed earlier in this talk, this, uh, um, this equation from our paper, which is the, the boundary operator in this twisted product. And that's, if the inputs are um, both two term chain complexes, then that's always uh, a, uh, the twisted product is always a good uh, chain complex. But if you imagine taking something else where the inputs involve like three term chain complexes like A2, A1, A0, then that um, formula I was showing, there's gonna be some consistency conditions between the boundary of the, of the different things in order to make it all consistent. And curvature is sort of a reflection that there's a tearing in that and you need to then add in some extra terms in order to fix things up. So there need to be some extra terms also present on the other side. Uh, which are in our paper, but not shown here. Um, so I don't have an intuitive idea as to why it would be useful. It's just sort of, um, gotcha. yeah, I don't, it, it, interesting thing to think about. Um, it is a generalization though. So like right. I mean, you know, there's, it's, there's it, it, it seems like a, there's a lot of ideas from topology that have proven useful in codes. And so uh, I think really one should just take every idea that one sees there and ask whether it has some interesting coding analog and, um, Right. Maybe we will. So that's a good takeaway from this talk. Mm -hmm. um, well, we are we are over the time. Um, there's there's at least one more question in the in the chat, but because we're at time, um, I think I'm going to call it. And other questions can be deferred to the um, to the roundtable. Um, you should stick around, Matt, and be directed there. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to thank uh, thank both speakers in the session. Uh, great results, uh, good plenary.
Um, yeah, and viewers should should uh, definitely visit the roundtables and talk with them. All right, bye.